All right, so picking up where we left off. So at 1,000 hertz, a pure tone is put in at 30 decibels. If the person doesn't hear 30 decibels, you automatically hop up to 50 decibels. If there's still no response at 50 decibels, then you go up in 10 dB steps until you get a response or you reach the limit of the audiometer. So every time you send a tone in, you should count to one, two, even three. So you give them the opportunity to uh, recognize that a tone is being sent in. As soon as you get a response, so let's say you do get a response at 30 decibels at 1,000 hertz, then you go down in 10 dB steps until you don't get a response again, until the responses stop. So you would go from 30 decibels to 20 decibels to 10 decibels to 0 decibels. Then let's say you don't get a response at 0 decibels, you go up to 5 decibels or up to 10 decibels. You go up in 5 dB steps until you get a response. And as soon as you get a response, you go back to 10 decibels. So this is called the threshold search. Basically, it's um, down 10, up 5. So think down 10, up 5, until you get like a 50% a 50 response rate at the person's threshold. And you'll usually like, for example, let's say the person's threshold is 10 decibels. So we start at 30, we go down to 20, we get a response. We go down to 10, we get a response. We go down to zero, we don't get a response. So where do we go from zero? We go up to five, no response. We go up to 10, we get a response. So that's two times we got it at 10. We try one more time, we go down to zero. We go up to five, we don't get a response. Let's say we go up to 10 and we don't get a response this time. What do you do? You go up to 15, you get a response. You go down to five. Then you go back up to 10. You're just gonna like bounce around the person's threshold till about 50% of the time you get it correct. I mean, you get like a, a positive response. So person's threshold doesn't change from like, it stays pretty consistent. Over the years, it'll change, it'll get worse, but in general, it stays like pretty consistent. So you're kind of going to like dance around a person's hearing threshold um, at each frequency. And remember, the threshold is the lowest level that someone can hear a sound. And that's what we're searching for. So you obtain the threshold at 1,000 hertz. You go up to 2,000 hertz. You start where you left off. You do the same thing, down 10, up 5, and you dance around a person's threshold. And you do it at 2,000 hertz, at 4, at 8,000 hertz. Okay? So down 10, up 5, until you get about a 50% response rate. And then you're going to mark the, um, the recording on the audiogram. So you're going to use a circle for the right ear and an X for the left ear. And I'm going to you know, listen to the PowerPoint about understanding the audiogram. So you're going to record the air conduction threshold, the lowest level that a person hears a sound, for the air conduction testing on the audiogram. And the audiogram is a picture. It's a graph that records the frequency of someone's hearing and the threshold of their hearing, their intensity of the hearing. And it's referenced to normal, to what, what is um, the... So back in like World War II, they took like thousands of healthy young men and they measured their hearing and they determined that zero was like the threshold of all these healthy young men. So the zero that we use is based off of these norms that they collected, you know, a while ago off of healthy young men. So if you get a response that's like negative 10 decibels, it doesn't mean that you're Superman and you have super hearing. It means that you are you know, negative 10 better than all these men who were tested um, back right before World War II. Like I said, you're going to mark the audiogram. On the audiogram, the patient's identifying information will be on it, the date of the exam, the equipment used, the patient's name, and um, the examiner's name, and the test reliability, whether they were, you know, fair, good, or poor reliability. We're going to mark an X for air conduction in the left ear and a red circle for air conduction in the right ear. Once you're done collecting someone's thresholds at 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 500, 250 hertz, you can collect their pure tone average. 
the pure tone average is the average threshold at 500,000 and 2,000 hertz. And the pure tone average covers the speech frequencies or the sounds that are important for speech. And um, you can compare it to the speech recognition threshold, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. So here's an example of a pure tone average. Let's say a person's threshold at 500 hertz was 40 decibels. At 1,000 hertz, it was 30 decibels. At 2,000 hertz, it was 45 decibels. You add up the threshold at those three frequencies, divide by three, and you get their pure tone average. And you have to do it separately for the right ear and the left ear. So you get you add up the thresholds in the right ear at 5, 1, and 2, and the thresholds in the left ear at 5, 1, and 2. Divide them each by 3, and then you get the pure tone average for the right ear or the left ear. Um, I think I forgot to mention that when we're testing someone's hearing with air conduction, I can't find the slide right now. When you're testing air conduction, you test these frequencies, okay? So 1, 2, 4, 8, you go back, you retest 1, you have 5 and 250. I want to make it clear again, you're going to get the threshold at these frequencies, the lowest level that they hear, and you might um, have to go back and test inner octave or test in between the frequencies if there's a big difference in thresholds between 1 and 2 or 2 and 4. So if there's a difference in thresholds of 20 decibels, you're going to go back and you're going to test inner octave. Okay, so we also do bone conduction testing. Remember, bone conduction tests the inner ear. So you put a bone oscillator or a vibrator on the inner ear and you directly stimulate the cochlea. By testing bone conduction, we can help separate out where the problem is. So air conduction gives us the severity of the hearing loss bone conduction helps us, along with the air scores, figure out if the problem is conductive, occurring in the outer ear or the middle ear, sensory neural occurring in the inner ear, or mixed in both. So distortion, bone conduction works three ways. There's distortion, inertia, and osseotympanic bone conduction. So with bone conduction, your skull, you're going to put a vibrator on the skull and all the bones in the skull are going to shake and move. And when those bones move, they give rise to an electrochemical activity that is identical to that created by the air conduction signal. Basically, the movement of the skull moves the fluid of the inner ear, and that tells the hair cells to fire and the auditory nerve to send the message up to the brain. So as the skull's moving, you also make the bones of the middle ear move. And when the bones of the middle ear are moving, they're going to start pushing on the cochlea, and that fluid in the cochlea will again begin moving, and the message will get sent to the brain that there's a sound. Also, you're going to have the movement in the ear canal pushing on the middle ear. So the air in the ear canal is going to start moving, and then that's going to push on the tympanic membrane, which will send the message through the middle ear, up to the cochlea that there's sound. Okay, so bone conduction happens three ways. I can put a vibrator on any portion of your skull and I can vibrate the bones of the skull, the bones of the middle ear, and the air in your ear canal and I can stimulate the cochlea to tell those hair cells to fire to send the message to the brain. Now, with bone conduction, we put the vibrator on the mastoid bone, that's the bone right behind your pinna, and it stimulates both ears at the same time. So you don't test the right ear or the left ear, they both get tested at the same time because the skull is connected. So basically, any, if I were to put a vibrator on any portion of your skull, I could stimulate hearing in both ears, but we usually place it on the mastoid bone. You have to be careful of the occlusion effect when you're testing bone conduction. So when you're testing bone conduction, you have to make sure the person isn't wearing a headset, earphones, because that will make the sound sound louder than they are. Basically, the vibrator vibrating the skull, and then you've got that osseotympanic bone conduction where the air in the ear canal starts moving. And if the ear canal is open, the air in the, not open, the air in the ear canal is gonna bounce off the headset and head back into the middle ear, and it's going to make the sound sound louder. So the occlusion effect is when you have your ears occluded or covered, 
It increases the intensity of the sound delivered by the bone conduction vibrator and sounds seem louder than they actually are. So you have to keep your ears uncovered if you're testing bone conduction or you can use insert earphones or you can use a correction factor. But in general, you know, if you use insert earphones, like I said, are best, you avoid problems like this. Okay, so bone conduction, um, the placement of the vibrator doesn't make any difference because you're going to get a response on either side. Again, it, it doesn't make any difference, but there's a way where we can mask one ear and we can separate out the ears so that we can get ear specific information and that's called masking. So we can, even though when I put the bone oscillator on, I measure both cochleas at the same time, I can distract one ear and separate out and get a, a, a bone conduction score for the right ear and a bone conduction score for the left ear. So your bone conduction scores are these carrots. When we separate out the ears to get an accurate response, we use brackets. And we separate out the ears using masking. So looking at your audiogram, you're going to look at each frequency and you're going to look at the amount of hearing loss by air conduction, the amount of hearing loss by bone conduction, and the difference between the air conduction scores and the bone conduction scores and that's called the air bone gap. So the difference between the air conduction scores and the bone conduction scores are going to give you the air bone gap and that's going to determine what type of hearing loss you have. So remember, air conduction tests demonstrate the loss and sensitivity of the entire system. Bone conduction talks about the inner ear and the auditory nerve. Looking at the air bone gap can help demonstrate the conductive component versus the sensory neural component. So there's this formula, the air bone gap equals air conduction scores minus bone conduction scores. So the air bone gap equals the air conduction threshold minus the bone conduction threshold and you have to do this for each frequency that you test. There may or may not be a bone a gap present. So here are some examples. Let's say your air conduction threshold, we're, pretend we're at 1,000 hertz. Let's say the air conduction threshold is 5 and the bone conduction threshold is 5. Now both of these scores, 5 decibels, is considered normal. Any threshold less than 20 decibels is considered normal. So 5 and 5, 5 minus 5 is 0, there's no gap. Both scores are within normal range. The hearing is normal. Here's another example. The air conduction threshold score is 35, so that's abnormal because it's not 20 or better. The bone conduction score is normal. So my bone conduction score is normal. That means my inner ear is normal. My air conduction score is abnormal. I have a gap between my air conduction score and my bone conduction score. I have a conductive hearing loss. I have a problem in the outer ear or the middle ear. Because my bone conduction score came back normal, that means that the inner ear is okay. But my air conduction score came back abnormal. That means that there was a problem in either the outer ear or the middle ear. And that is a conductive hearing loss. Now over in example 3, we have air conduction at 35, which is abnormal, and bone conduction at 35, which is also abnormal. Both scores are abnormal, but there's no gap. There's no difference between the scores. It's a sensory neural hearing loss. There is one problem, and they both got tripped up at the same problem in the cochlea, okay? Because bone, which tests the inner ear, was abnormal and air, which tests the whole system, was the same degree of abnormal. Now, the last example, we have an air conduction threshold at 60, which is abnormal, and a bone conduction threshold at 35, which is also abnormal, because it's worse than 20. So bone is coming across a problem, and air is coming across two problems. The air bone gap is 25, the air bone gap is greater than 10. 
and you have a mixed hair and loss. With people that have severe, hearing, severe sensory neural hearing losses, when you're testing bone conduction, you have to make sure that they're actually hearing the sound and they're not just responding to it vibrating really loud. So if someone comes out with like a severe mixed hearing loss, um, the chances are that you have the bone conduction oscillator so loud that it's vibrating and the person is feeling the response. Okay, so cross hearing is um, something that you have to be careful about with certain degrees of hearing loss. So if you remember when you go to the eye doctor, you will cover one eye, um, you know, you'll have to cover your left eye to test your right eye and whatnot. So sometimes with hearing, we do the same thing. We'll, we'll knock out the left ear or we'll knock out the right ear to um, get a more accurate test. And we mask that ear. We knock it out by masking it. Masking means we put in like a noise to distract the ear. So we do that when there's a big difference between the right ear and the left ear scores. We'll put noise in the better ear to distract it so that it can't help the weaker ear. Okay, so we do that um, masking. We'll do it for air conduction or for bone conduction. I'm not going to ask you any sort of formulas for it. I just want you to know when um, scores are very different between ears, we mask for air conduction. And when the scores are greater, when there's an air bone gap greater than 10, between bone conduction scores and air conduction scores, we also mask. And masking is blocking one ear by putting noise in from helping the other ear. All right, so that's masking when we kind of knock out one ear to get a more accurate measure on the other ear.